Kevin Goff. All right, here we go. How y'all doing? That's a good start. That's good. I'm glad. Hey, uh, I was looking over my notes. I put these together about a month, month and a half ago. And so today I was doing some things for our team back home and writing some stuff for our team. And I thought I better get my notes out and check them out. And I realized two things. I realized that uh, this isn't going to be a real easy word for some. I also realized it's going to be a little bit longer than the last two. So I tried to figure out what I could cut out. So here we go. Love you guys. Love you guys. Love you guys. Let's go. <laughs> no, I do. I love your pastor so much. I do want to say how much they mean to us through the years. Uh, we can sit around and talk about memories of the last 18 years and even stop around and recall some things we've said to one another and remind each other that we're still standing together and all those things. But I, I told pastor just before church, and I leaned up and told Miriam the same thing. I love y'all. I really do. I love this church and, and I love people in general, but I love this church after all these years. Many of you I've known for all these years and some of you brand new this year and I've already grown to love you. And uh, it's great to see James and Marin. Love them. Love them. Love, love them. I, I call them kids because I'm 56 now, so everyone's becoming a kid to me that's below me. Uh, I'm to that age now where everyone's becoming a kid. Uh, we've got some kids from Anchorage. It's great to have Thad and Michael White along with Tyler with us. Come on. Uh, we talk, we talk and uh, we stay in touch. I meant, I meant Riley. Was, is it Riley? Riley? Is it Riley? Yeah. I won. Anyway, so it, it's, 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 important. it's important that we understand uh, through the years we, we do build these things and we do build relationships and we keep relationships. Come on. We build relationships and we keep relationships. I don't break relationships. If, if you break it with me, that's on you. But I'm going to see you in heaven. I believe every relationship is eternal. And so I just decided I'm going to keep every relationship on earth. As long as you'll have me, I'm going to have you. And I think it's sad when relationships break. I don't care if it's marriage. I don't care if it's friendships. I don't care if it's family life. It's sad when relationships get destroyed on earth. Can you say amen? amen. And so let's just not do that. Let's just, let's just stay together. Let's just say we're a family and, and we just love one another and we just, we just decide we're going to be friends from now on. All right? And friends, as Michael W. Smith said, are friends forever. Right? And we'll say forever. Forever. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that as we come today, your word is anointed. God, we pray that you'd open our eyes, the eyes of our understanding. You enlighten us to the truth, God. And we just thank you for that. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Come on, ever say amen. amen. I, I don't know about all speakers, whether it's at church or conferences. It doesn't matter to me. I have one great concern, and that's always that you're not hearing me. Uh, I, I have a concern that the word of God's going forth, and it's you take what you want, and then you just kind of do it with the rest. It's kind of like sometimes eating salmon that wasn't filleted well. You know what I'm saying? You eat the salmon, you get rid of the bones. But every now and then, how many know is you still get a bone? And you can't just throw things away all the time. When it comes down to the word, you got to take it all. I want to say take it all. Take it all. If the Bible, I want it. I don't want part of it. I want all of it. And so a concern of mine is that you're, we're just maybe hearing part of what God is saying. That's why this week I tried to connect every one of my messages so we can build upon one another. You know, just line up on line, precept up on precept, go to that next step. And so tonight, I want to give you the title of my message that's going to just come and all this together, and that is this. It's simply this. Don't wait until life is shocking. Come on, everyone say, don't wait. Don't wait. Come on, everyone say, don't wait, don't wait. until life is shocking. Don't Back to our uh, scripture we've been using in the beginning of each one of these for me is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. And you recall that this is Samuel going to find a new king to replace Saul. He's going to Jesse's house. He's looking through all of his sons. That's when David is discovered. But the Lord said, don't look at his height. Don't look at his appearance. The Lord does not see things the way we see them. And I said the other night that that is a big line. The Lord don't see things the way we see them. If we're not careful, we see things the way we're comfortable with. If we're not careful, we see things skewed by what makes us feel better about ourselves. What is pop culture around us? You know, it's popular around us, so therefore it must be true. And therefore we see things skewed certain ways. But the Lord don't see things the way we see them because in Him there is no shadow of turning. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There 
therefore, whatever he's been, he's, he'll always be. You and I, if we're not careful, we can shift. There can be shadows of turning in us. If we're not careful, we can be chameleons fitting in the crowd wherever we are at the time. It takes a person that's mature in their heart. It takes a person mature in spirit to say, wherever I go, I'm going to be who I'm supposed to be. I'm going to be who I'm created to be. I'm coming into the identity of who I am in Christ Jesus, regardless of where I am. Come on, y'all with me. Then it says, people judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Over the years, the natural heart, when we talk about the heart within our chest, can develop problems if not maintained, right? Uh, clogged arteries, murmurs, valves, uh, le leaky valves, stress, a myriad of all kinds of problems that can happen we've heard about or we've seen. My father had a heart condition. The last few years of his life, he walked around carrying an air tank, as I mentioned, that he had a heart that was not good at age 59. He he had quadruple bypass. My father passed away at 67 years old. I plan on blowing that out of the water. Can you say amen? amen? So we're told over and over and over that the Lord looks on the heart. We've read that many times this week. We've heard other speakers say that. We're, we've also learned that we're instructed to keep and guard the heart. That's another scripture that's been talked about. Keep your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues or determines the course or determines the boundaries is the size of our life. When we see the natural heart, it isn't enough just to have the natural heart guarded. God created us with the natural heart guarded. It's deep within the rib cage, a safe place where we can bounce off steering wheels and we might break a rib, but our heart is secure. It's not enough just to have the natural heart guarded. We also have to maintain the natural heart for the heart to be healthy. Come on, look at someone and say, maintain your heart. So the same is true with our spiritual heart, right? God guards it through the righteousness of Jesus, but to live a life of blessing, to live a life of promise, to live a positive life, a life of influence, we must also maintain our spiritual heart, our walk with God, the dynamics of who we are within the spirit of Christ Jesus. And so I think that's important. So Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13, it says it this way, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. Listen to it again. A merry heart, come on, ever say merry heart, heart, makes a cheerful countenance. I can tell if you got a merry heart just by looking at your face. <laughs> right? Some of you haven't had a merry heart for a while. I got three staff members that every now and then I look at these three staff members and staff and I'll say, hey y'all, remind yourself that your face is born again. <laughs> <laughs> right? I got three of them. If they're watching, they know who they are. I wouldn't call them out in public, but one's my daughter-in-law. <laughs> She's been up here. Y'all love her. She's a sweetheart. She's learning how to smile more and more and more. Come on, a merry heart. It shows on your countenance. Come on, everyone smile real big like you got a merry heart. Then in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, it says, A merry heart does good. Like a medicine. So I figure I'm going to live a long time as merry as I am, as joyful as I am, as much as I feel good inside. I think I'm going to live a ripe old age. I plan on going past 100 years. That's my plan. I plan on going as long as I can. Somewhere around 101, I'm going to lay my last Harley down for the day and just go away. Right? See, some of y'all are laughing. Some of you are like, he'll probably get it done. Yeah, more than likely, I will. But a broken spirit dries up the bones. You ever seen the people that have a broken spirit? They walk around with a broken heart. They walk around with turmoil inside, issues after issue after issue. They haven't smiled so long. If they did, their socks would fall down. <laughs> That's like a major facelift just to smile, people. Come on, a merry heart has it on the countenance. A merry heart is like a medicine. A merry heart gives long life, but a broken heart dries up the bones. I think that's important to understand. And so those of us who understand having a merry heart, we understand that it makes life great. I, I had a friend, and it still have a friend, uh, that's, a, that's a paramedic. And you know, when he arrives upon a scene, his first thought isn't, I wonder what model car this is. I wonder if they're wearing designer clothes. No, the first thing he thinks is their heart beating. Yeah. 
The first thing he thinks about is how, what condition is the heart? What rate do we have on the heart? That's the first thing they start checking on the people in the accident. Where's your heart rate? What's going on? Is your heart beating? If it's not, we need to get it beating as fast as we can because we know if the heart doesn't beat and oxygen's lost, it will cause brain damage. Come on, y'all with me? So the question tonight I have for you, is your heart beating? Because if not, that might be why you're suffering from some of your brain damage. <laughs> Come on, look at someone say he's talking to you now. <laughs> yeah. My, <laughs> that's the best response yet. My, my, my father's heart used to go into uh, a fast rhythm. And it would go into AFib. It would go into this rhythm where it would run away from itself. And they would have to shock his heart and stop it for six seconds and restart it to get it back in rhythm. Did you know there is a rhythm in our spiritual life that we've got to lock into? Or many times our heart, our heart will get shocked by life. And, and many people, even in this small part of Soldatna sitting here, you've had your heart shocked repeatedly just to try to find the rhythm of God time after time after time. If you're not careful, there'll come a time if you don't stay within the rhythm of God, you don't stay walking out in the rhythm of God, you don't stay within the presence of God, you don't stay in the Word of God, you can suffer heart damage that will eventually even destroy your life. Come on, ever say the rhythm of God. God's desire is that all of our hearts would be functioning in the rhythm of the destiny He has for us. That would be God's desire for each one of us. He wants, he wants, the, he, he wants the issue back in rhythm. Come on, get rid of the issues and give them to God so they're back in rhythm, right? He wants our thoughts back in rhythm. The Lord wants His rhythm pumping through our hearts. He wants His life pumping through our hearts. There's a man in the Bible named Samson I want to talk about just for a moment. We're not going to read the story. If you want to know where it's at, just write it down. It's Judges chapter 16, just to redeem some time. I just go write that down, read the story later. Probably no, most of you know it. You hear the name Samson and Delilah. Uh, they've written songs about it. Years ago, if you remember, there was Romeo and Juliet. Remember that? Samson and Delilah. I remember that. I mean, don't remember that. All the young people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> Samson is a man in Judges 16 that had his heart shocked repeatedly. That life builds up when we don't think correctly, we don't live correctly, we don't live according to God's rhythm. That life has a way of shocking our heart. And if we're not careful, we live in such a way we wait till life gets shocking. And my encouragement tonight is don't wait until life gets shocking. The story in Judges 16 goes something like this. He falls in love with Delilah. And she starts to betray him for 1,100 pieces of silver from each of the leaders that's recommending this. It's said today that the silver would value approximately $90,000. I don't know. Who cares? All I know is he fell in love and the woman started betraying him. Right? Some of you are like, that happened to me. That's okay. You don't have to have the same turnout. <laughs> All she had to do was find out where his strength was. Because Samson is the original strong man you can read about. All she had to do was discover what made him strong because he was a warrior constantly coming against the Philistines. And so they were trying to destroy him so he could no longer destroy them. So here's how it goes. She wakes up, or she's with him one night. She says, tell me where your strength is found. And he says, well, if there's seven new bowstrings that have not been yet dried, I will be weak like any man. So as he sleeps, she ties him up with those bowstrings, and she says, the Philistines are approaching. He wakes up, obviously, and breaks the strings, right? And so then it happens another time. She says, tell me where your strength is found. And he says, well, if you, if there's a, uh, you brown new ropes, if you do this and you bind them together that have never been used, I will be weak like any man. So she binds him up as he's asleep with these ropes. She screams, the Philistines are coming. He wakes up and he breaks the ropes. Now it happens a third time. And she's telling each time, you're making fun of me. 
Then he, she says for the third time, tell me where your strength is found. And he says, well, if you weave seven braids of my hair into the fabric of your loom, I'll be weak like any man. And sure enough, she does it while he's asleep again and says, the Philistines are approaching. He wakes up, still has his strength. You would think by now yeah. there would be a light coming on in Samson. <laughs> Welcome to the world of being a freaking pastor. <laughs> because I hear this same story with a different face and a different couple or different person repeatedly. And I end up thinking, I would think by now you would have a light coming on. Amen. We can make fun of Samson, but we've all had the same thing. Shock after shock, warning after warning, our heart gets shot back into the rhythm, and then we fall for it again. And this is what's going on. Now what happens? Del Delilah begins to pout. That's what one version says. Delilah pouted and said, you're just making fun of me. If you really love me, oh boy. women, oh boy. <laughs> she began to pout and said, if you really love me, you would take me to Italy. <laughs> if you really love me, you take me out of Sedalna. <laughs> if you really love me, you'd buy me that diamond ring. These are all the words I've heard from my wife over the years. <laughs> love you, babe. It's exactly how my wife got me to buy her a diamond ring. Begin to pout and said, if you really love me, we fall for it. There's an old sermon from years ago entitled, and the pastors have heard it, some of you probably have, it said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. You can say it any way you want, but it's the basic thought of what's going on. Look at your life. Take a view of your life. Is it what you intended it to be? Is it what you had planned for it to be? Better yet, is it the plan that God had for your destiny? Because the truth is, if we're still falling for what we've always fallen for, we'll never live out the destiny that God has for us because we have to have the rhythm of God, the heartbeat of God, the word of God within us for us to live the destiny that God has for us. Amen. Come on and say, guard your heart. Oh, Samson liked where he was at. Yeah. He laid his head in that lap every night and was just like, <laughs> falling for it over and over and over. There's pleasure in sin for a season. The Bible says that. I had someone tell me one time, this lady said, well, uh, I have never had pleasure in sin. I said, then you didn't know how to sin. <laughs> I'm not sure she's at our church anymore. <laughs> I'm a really good Christian. I'm not bragging. I'm, I love God. I love the Word. I live the Word. I meditate on the Word every morning. I, I read and study. I, I follow after Him. I worship. I pour myself. I check myself before I wreck myself every day. I'm a great Christian. But I'll tell you right now, say what you want. I was a great sinner. <laughs> you want a party? You should have hung out with me because we had a party wherever we go. And the truth is, we still do wherever I go. My religion hasn't slowed down my party. I just have a different type of party, right? Come on, y'all with me? So I'm just as, I was just as good at sinning as I am at being a Christian. People with unguarded hearts that don't guard their hearts are left to guide their lives only one way. We mentioned this the other night. It's by faulty emotions. If you're not guiding your life and your heart by the word of God, the only thing left are your feelings and your faulty emotions. And I got news for every one of you. All of our emotions are faulty. That's why you can leave the house in the morning in a good mood. And you don't get a strike on the river all day and you get home in a bad mood. Right? And then when he walks in the door, you want him to walk back out and come back in with a different attitude. And women, we feel the same way sometimes. Right? Because of faulty emotions. 
that our, that our feelings will fool us. <laughs> so some of you are living by those emotions. The word of God, the truth is the only sure thing. But I'm making good money. Yeah, but is it honest money? Think about it. I'll pull it into some of the areas that maybe you deal with. But I just want to party while I'm young. <laughs> but it's a trap. Because before you know it, the years pass, the Bible says, like a weaver's shuttle. And I know this because I'm 56 years old with four grandchildren now. Which is hard to believe when you look at me. I know, you're shocked. <laughs> yeah, but he or she loves me. <laughs> How about that one? <laughs> yeah, but is it love that's in line with God's word? Does God agree with your fantasy? Does God agree with your attitude? Does God agree with your relationship? Does God agree with your habits? Does God agree with who you being in your life? Or better yet, does your life line up and agree with the Word of God? Come on, y'all with me. Yeah. Let me just tell you my story. This, this is, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell my story. Uh, when my wife and I went through a divorce... And I lost my mind. I was manic depressive bipolar disorder. I was on several hundred milligrams of lithium a day. Literally under psychiatric care. But the one thing I knew is I had to stay close to God. So every Sunday, whether I was out drunk all night, stoned all night, doing crystal meth all night, which was not, was made a whole lot easier to get up. But uh, what, <laughs> what I'm saying is no matter what the condition was, I was in church every Sunday. And the church I attended was a friend of mine. It was all African-American church. I stood out like a sore thumb, literally. I, I mean, I stood out like... Urgh! And every day I'd come in on Sunday with the girl I was living with, not my wife. I'm going through divorce. I'm living with someone else. And I would walk in the church and sit down the back row. And sure enough, he'd have an usher come get us and put us on the front row and set me right there. <laughs> I just knew when I walked down through there was a lead, you know, scarlet A over my head. <laughs> Until I realized, just like some of us, we're narcissistic. No one's really thinking about us at all. Yeah. No one really thinking about us is Jesus, how to get us back in line. No one else cares about it. Everyone else is just cheering us on. But we judge our own selves because our heart is not right. So I would sit there. And all of a sudden, one day, he taught a message on the difference between love and lust. I'd already been a pastor for seven years. I already taught that message probably a dozen times. But as I sat there in church that day, the Holy Spirit gripped my heart because he said, lust takes, lust destroys, lust brings problems, lust tears down, love gives, love builds, love adds, love is kind. And he began, and I thought to myself, I'm not in love. I'm in lust. So I went home that day and I looked at the young lady and said, you got to move out because I don't love you. And she said, no. I said, yes. <laughs> that was the exact thing that happened in my life. I'm being vulnerable. I'm just, I'm just being honest. And if you don't like me now, I don't need you anyway. So let's move on. <laughs> so the problem was I was living a life with an unguarded heart. I was living a life where my heart hadn't been guarded. And I was just living by what I felt. I was living by my emotions. I was living by what I thought was right because it felt right. My heart wasn't guarded by the word. It wasn't led by the truth. I wasn't living in his promise. All I was doing was feeding my flesh with the lustful things that made me feel good at that time. My ego, whatever it may have been, it didn't represent the Lord. It represented myself. Come on, y'all with me. Yeah. So, I'm going to be honest with myself, and I'm vulnerable about what I went through. Can you be honest with yourself tonight? Can you open your heart and let God examine it according to His Word? Let me give you a few steps. Three steps to guarding our hearts. Can I do that as I, as I get ready to leave? A few steps. Here are three steps to guarding our heart. Number one, recognize alien thoughts and feelings are invited into our spiritual heart by our carnal heart. I'll leave it up there just for a moment. Recognize alien thoughts and feelings are invited into our spiritual heart by our carnal heart. We all have, we all have duplicity going on. We all, we all have carnal side, a carnal mind, a spiritual mind, and, and, and a carnal mind. We all have a carnal heart and a spiritual heart. And all those negative things, all those alien thoughts, all those feelings that, that, that are contrary to the Word of God, they're invited into our spiritual heart through our carnal living, our carnal heart. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The human heart 
is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Everyone say the carnal heart. You have a side. I have a side that is desperately wicked. I am a great man with Jesus. Without him, you don't want to know me. Oh, you're not that tough. No, I'm only five, eight and three quarters, but I know how to use a board. <laughs> I've hit more than one person with a board in my lifetime, right? There's a side of me that's not pleasant. My wife has seen that side. My children have seen that side. My friends have seen that side. My church as a pastor has seen that side. I was talking to a man one night, he, and, and he, he, he's, he was one of those guys that tends to whine about everything. And I was sitting in the car in the rain with him, and I was kind of just trying to console him. And he says, well, you know, the truth is I don't think you love me, and I just think I need to go to church somewhere else. And this is right before my divorce, and didn't know I was losing my mind. <laughs> I really thought I was in my right mind. And I opened the door of the van. I said, okay, do me a favor. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you. Slam! Good friend of mine. But do you know that to this day he reminds me, you remember that time you told me not to let the door hit me? <laughs> to which now I've renewed my mind. Like, I'm so sorry, but why haven't you left yet? <laughs> he came back to my second church. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Before we post that, can we delete that? <laughs> Desperately wicked, the heart. Everyone say the heart. the heart. The human heart, the fleshly heart, the lustful heart. It's like flipping through the channels on our cable TV one night and we see a steamy love scene. And we go, oh, oh, and we turn it. But then we scan the channels again just a little bit more slowly. <laughs> time after time. Until it rests there like the channels broke. Everyone say desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Mm. My wife will tell you that when I'm watching anything and something like that comes on, I cover my eyes. I cover my eyes. That's why I don't recommend movies because I don't remember. I'll say something about, you should see this movie. My wife says, shut up. She said, you had your eyes covered. I said, you didn't. <laughs> You know what Job 31.1 says? Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. What about the old women? Well, you don't need a covenant for that. <laughs> There's no covenant needed for, for that. Is that bad? I don't even know why you come hear me. Seriously, seriously, Job 31.1 reveals the actions of a guarded heart. It, it really does. I've made a covenant with my eyes. And while we're laughing, I want you to come back to understand, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I've made a covenant with my eyes. We can say it this way, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I've made a covenant with my ears. I've made a covenant with my mouth. I've made a covenant with my mind. I've made a covenant with my heart. I've made a covenant with my God. That whatever is wrong... I want to weed out of my life so that I can walk in the fullness of all that he has for me and the path that he has for me and the destiny he has for me because like it or not, until you're on that path, you'll never be fully fulfilled. Be fully. And some of you have walked off that path to a place that if you don't come back, just like Samson, your life will be destroyed. And we say, my heart. My heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Look at this. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Run. Flee! Run! Run! Forest! Run! <laughs> Instead, pursue. There's that word. Look, pursue. Chase after. Be determined for. And li righteous living. Faithfulness. Love. Peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure Hearts. Everyone say pure hearts. Pure hearts. Youthful lusts. See, some of you right now are dealing with youthful lust, 
whether it's an addiction, a relationship, whether it's greed, envy, whether it's jealousy, it's youthful lust. What is youthful lust? It's what, what makes you act young and stupid. I'm 56 years old, and I can turn around tomorrow and act young and stupid. As long as you've got a heart beating in your chest, you can act young and stupid in a, j a jumping jack flash. Come on, y'all with me? You can. You've done it. We've all done it. Yep. It's, like, it's like life, if you're not careful, if you don't stay on top of what life really all is about, it's like the old dress or the old shirt in the closet. Right? And, and then you go buy a new dress. You don't ever want to buy the old. You don't ever want to wear the old dress anymore. Life can be like that for us if we're not careful. It's like, oh gosh, that old Christianity thing, that's just like an old dress in my closet. I want something new. That's young and stupid. It's the security of God's love. It's the security of God's righteousness through Jesus Christ that keeps us on the path that he has for us. The good things. Everyone say the good things. Good things. Number two, write this one down. If necessary, physically move yourself to another location. <laughs> let, me, let me say it again. Keep it up there. If necessary, physically remove yourself to another location. I was in the house one night and my phone rang. And on the other end of the phone is a lady, and she's screaming, I shot him! I shot him! I shot him! This was a troubled marriage in my church. And I could hear him in the background going, ah! ah! And I was like, oh, God, where did you shoot him? Which she answered, in the condominium. <laughs> this lady has lost her mind. No, where on his body? And she literally shot her husband in the foot. So I run over, grab their kids before CPS gets there to make sure everything's good. And don't tell me crazy don't happen to people. This was a business couple. This was a solid couple. And what was it the police said? You are leaving here tonight. Not in handcuffs. She should have. But they removed her from the house because tensions were high. <laughs> I was like, no, I've seen tensions high. This is far past high. <laughs> See, some of you are in a very tough, tempting, lustful, terrible, tense relationship with someone or something. And you're so attached, you don't want to remove yourself. But when you don't, you remove yourself from the very blessings of God. Not that God don't love you. Not that God don't want to be with you. God hasn't removed you from anywhere. You have chosen to walk your way, which is not His way. And I know this because of my history. Everyone say history. I don't know. Look, Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. So if your eye, even your good eye, <laughs> that sounds like the guy that was... Blind in one eye and couldn't see out of the other. Your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust. Gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. Now, I don't think God wants us to walk around gouging our eye out. That's a bit weird. Okay? But I also know he don't want us to walk around and ripping our heart out. What he's saying is, take extreme measures when necessary to get your life correct, is what he, it's the point. Back to myself. When I got home and I looked at this young lady I was living with and said, I don't love you, this is lust, you have to leave. And she said, no, you love me. I said, no, I don't, this is not love. It stripped my family, it stripped my life, it stripped my kids' dignity, it stripped, my, it stripped everything from me. And it stripped your dignity, it stripped your reputation, it's put you in a bad light. If I loved you like a person loves through God, I would have never put you here. You know what I did? I called my mama. <laughs> And I said, Mama, can I move home? Because she lived in California. And she said, yeah, me and my three boys went and lived in California while God healed my mind and God healed my marriage and God healed my life. I physically removed myself from the situation because I knew as long as I was there, I couldn't think correctly. I couldn't renew my mind. I couldn't get my rhythm. I couldn't get my heart back in rhythm with the heart of God. 
So I had to physically remove myself to get it right. Come on, everyone say, get it right. Get it right. Whatever it takes is the point. That's what Matthew is stating here. It's an extreme measure, but whatever it takes to line up with God's word is what you have to do. I was, I was witnessing my wife sharing with a young lady on the phone the other day, and I could hear the young lady saying, but I don't love him. I have no feelings for him. He has destroyed me. This is terrible. And my wife said, I know how you feel. I had nothing for my husband. I couldn't stand him. He repulsed me. And I'm like, easy, easy. I'm sitting right here. I can hear you. She's, no, I'm talking about my first husband. Like, That's me, kind of. But God restored my heart. But God restored my love. But God restored our home. But God reignited the original match and even better. But God super glued us back together. But God did what no one could do on their own strength because we were willing to go to extreme measures, whatever it took to make life right. Amen? Amen? Come on, look at someone and say, whatever it takes. Last point, number three. Number three. Develop a regular fellowship with God and His bride. Develop a regular fellowship with God. And this is funny because I'm not laughing at people. But as a pastor, once again, it shocks me that people don't get that their relationship with God is the barometer of their life. The one that created you, you should know, is the barometer of your life. It's the gauge of how you live. He is the one. So I can show you verbatim any church. I could, I could sit and talk with every one of you in this church. I can listen to you, look how you live your life, see what's going on in your life, see the outcome of your days, see the agitations of your heart, see the frustrations you live in, see the depression going on, see the anxiety you live with, see the course of all your actions, see the issues you deal with, and tell you what your spiritual life's like. Every time, 100%. Because if a spiritual life is like this, then a regular natural life is like this. If the spiritual life is in the tank, the natural life is in the tank. You're just hoping you don't kill one another before next Christmas. <laughs> you fight, you struggle, you argue, you, you wrestle. You, you, you get depressed. You wonder why your life's not working out. Why does everything work out for everyone else? I can't even find a car or a job. And then you don't understand that you've removed yourself from the very thing that matters, which is the heart of God and the blessings of God in your life. He wants to bless you. But you've got to have regular fellowship with Him. Many speakers have talked about it this week. A fellowship with God. A, a life with Jesus. A life where... You pour yourself before him every morning. And, by the way, not just with Jesus, with his bride, which is the church. Everyone say the church. the church. Well, I don't think you have to go to church to be a Christian. I get so sick of hearing those flimsy, mamsy, pamsy excuses. Just call it what it is. You're lazy and don't want to get up on Sunday. Right? That's the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. We make excuses. It's the bride of Christ. You don't just fellowship with Jesus. You fellowship with the bride. That's like you telling me, oh, Kevin, I love you, but you treat Melissa wrong. You don't have to worry about loving me because I will have nothing to do with you if you treat my bride wrong. And some of you just flippantly act like the church is something you can flip around and, and you can flip off or you can, do, you, can, you, can, you can do whatever you want. You can thumb your nose at it. You can talk about the people. You can talk about the pastors. You can gossip about various things and you act like it's okay, but it's the bride of Christ. And I'm telling you right now, if you treat my bride that way, I'm going to find one of those boards I talked about earlier. Come on, y'all with me? Oh, I just love Jesus. No, 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 no. You can't just love Jesus. You have to understand you're married to Jesus. Some of you are still acting like you're dating Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I love you. I'll pick you up tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. We'll have some time then, okay? But meantime, meantime, ain't no ring on my finger. No, no, you're married to Jesus. You're the bride of Christ. 
And every time you think you can spend time with Jesus and not fellowship with his bride and have a relationship that's A-OK, you're missing something very important. Ever say, Jesus? Jesus. And was the and his bride. And his bride. You, you, you know, Pastor Allen wouldn't let me walk into their house and say, I love you, man. You're my friend. Miriam, you just drive me crazy. Everything about you, I can't stand anything about you. You just, why don't you clean your house? Why don't you do this? And he'd be like, you, 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 you need to get out of my house. Tell me a husband that wouldn't. See, we say we would never let a man treat our wife that way, but we treat the bride of Christ ways that we should never treat the bride of Christ. Amen. Now we're talking. See, commitment to him is fellowship and commitment to his teachings and his bride. In other words, once again, we've got to line up with his word. One more thing. I'm going to say it this way. I learned this lesson about treating the bride of Christ correctly when I was going through my divorce and God was restoring us. Because when God renewed my mind, I went off my meds and my mind was healed. All of a sudden I was like, yeah, I got this. I'm not going to argue anymore. I'm not going to fuss anymore. And she was pushing every button. She would tell you that if she was here. She was just making sure I was healed. And she was saying everything she could do. And she was still going out to the bars at night. And I'd be sitting at home going, okay. And, 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 and so she would push. And all of a sudden, it suddenly it happened about three or four months into it. I, I lost my cool with her. She lost it with me. And I lost it. And I walked down. I slammed the door. I walked downstairs. I slammed the bathroom door downstairs. I grabbed the sink. <coughs> Anyone ever do this? Anyone ever talk to yourself? Yeah. I looked in the mirror and said, She makes me so mad! <laughs> and here's what the Holy Spirit told me. No, she don't make you mad. That's your emotion. It belongs to you. You can live by it or you can keep it to yourself. Then he said this to me. Why are you treating my daughter that way? My bride. My, the one I love. I learned it the hard way. I'll never forget that in comparison to the church. I'm not going to sit around and let people talk about you, defile you, let you defile this pastor and his wife or anyone else. Why? Because I love Jesus and I love his bride. Come and look at someone and say, I love his bride. I love his bride. Hmm. My commitment to Jesus accentuates my commitment to his bride. Did you hear that? My commitment to Jesus seals the deal. I'm committed to his bride. <laughs> well, I feel like God is moving me. <laughs> Do you know how many times I've heard... People say, I feel like God's moving me, and God had nothing to do with it. <laughs> the only time God would move you, let me just say this. The only time God would move you, if there was, if there was any sort of uh, inappropriate behavior, if there was any misappropriation of funds, if, if there was some type of immorality. But nowadays, it's not immorality that moves people, it's immaturity. I'm that one person that changed searches so often, I swore they took a spiritual X lax. Every time I saw them, they was being moved. <laughs> That's so crude. Well, okay, we're talking about attitudes here. <laughs> I suspect some of you would be upset with me. <laughs> a stable church life is one of the largest keys to a stable heart. Yeah. To a guarded heart. God isn't moving us. Our emotions are moving us. We're moving where our friends move. We're moving where no one knows my history. We're moving where I can start all over. That's not our problem. We're going to love you where you're at. You know, if every time I got upset with my wife, I left her, I would be away from her as much as I'm with her sometimes. Right? Times of friction. How many has been married more than two hours? <laughs> Those of you that has been married two hours, you probably already still had 45 minutes of emotions. <laughs> you 
You're being led by circumstances. You're being, you're being led by feelings. That's what I talked about with the heart. Then you wonder why your heart is so fragile. You wonder why your heart is out in the open and so unguarded. That's because you're not doing the things necessary to guard your heart. And I know there's times of change. I know there's that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where it's not God that moved you. I'm not talking about it was God that changed the course of direction. I'm talking about you starting over again and again, and you wonder why you're not stable. Wonder why you're always being shocked. Wonder why your pulse has to be brought back to the rhythm of God continually. Mature people don't leave their family when things get tough. Amen? I'd like to see the Apostle Paul's expression when he hears some of the reasons people leave churches now. I got a feeling Paul would have some stuff to say. Right? If you're looking for a church or a family with no dysfunction, guess what? There's no such thing. Let me say this, because this is what the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart. You can write it down. I don't know if I have it on the screen or not. I hope so. Sometimes better the dysfunctions we know than the dysfunctions we've not yet met or met yet. Well, I went, I left. Sometimes the dysfunctions we know huh, are better than the dysfunctions we've not met yet. Come on, y'all with me? You sometimes will jump out of the frying pan into the fire. When I left my wife and was living with this young lady, it took three months, three months for me. And she, and my wife would tell you, I'm not sharing anything she's not comfortable with because we've talked about it. We've talked about it at marriage conferences. My wife looked at me right one day in the park and said, you should keep her. She's the best thing that's ever happened to you. She would cook my meals, iron my clothes, rub my feet when I got home, baby me. Are you okay? How was your day? It took me three months to go, don't touch my clothes, don't touch my feet, don't touch my food, and don't ever talk to my kids again. Why? Because it wasn't in line with God's word for me. It wasn't God's best for me. It wasn't what God had for me. Come on, y'all with me. Yeah. Biblical reasons for living, what would be what? Dishonesty, heresy, immorality, not immaturity. Not I've been offended. Not I got hurt. Somebody treated me wrong. I didn't get to see the song I wanted to sing. I went to take the offering and the pastor said I was being too loud. You want me to just keep going with the excuses I've heard? The pastor didn't shake my hand. Church has grown too much. We don't even play cards anymore. <laughs> You're never at church anymore, pastor. It's not always you preaching. As if God's word isn't good with someone else that might be sharing it because it's only through one person it's good. <laughs> the point is, if Jesus sent you somewhere, circumstances and emotions should never move you. Amen? Amen. If you're just not being faithful, maybe you're here, but you're not attending. Maybe, the, maybe Sodotna is your church, but you're just not faithful. Well, then you'll never be steady. You'll never be steady without faithfulness. It's a, it's a big key to guarding your heart. Can you say amen? amen? So light, lock, and live. There's some words for you. Light. In other words, light where you're at. Stay where you're at. Lock in there and live. Because then you'll find God's best for your life. Don't wait until life is shocking to make necessary changes. So how do we do it? Three things. Recognize alien thoughts and feelings are invited into our spiritual heart by a carnal heart. If necessary, physically move yourself to another location. And lastly, develop regular fellowship with God and His bride. And stay put. Come on, look at someone and say, stay put. Stay. I, I don't even know who this is for because I wrote this a month, a month and a half ago. And, and here's what I felt in my heart when I was writing it. That the enemy wants to come in and remove you from your family because he knows if he can isolate you from your family, he has access to your emotions. If he gets access to your emotions, he can destroy your life. I've guarded my children's hearts for years. I've never let them be separated. I've never let them run from us. I've always said we're going to keep talking. Why? Because I know God gave me a voice to their ears. They didn't always agree with me. They didn't always like me. I didn't always like them. 
I looked at my 33-year-old one time and said, I made one like you before I make another one just like you. I'll take you out right now. <laughs> Come on. We're talking family life. But we're still together. Are we the family of God? Yes. About eight of us are. <laughs> are we the family of God? Yes. Did God call you to a church? Yes. Then you better stay at that church until something else moves you, not your emotions or your offenses. Yes. Why? Because it's God's plan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all love me? Yes. Good, because this is a hit and run. I'm leaving. I caught you in a hit and run. Straight up, now tell me. Okay. <laughs> Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus for every individual that's here right now. I, I, God, I just pray that they hear the word tonight. That every one of them that's present, God, would understand what you're saying directly to their hearts. God, I believe there were words spoken tonight that was directly for individuals where they live, where they're at. That you're saying things, God, that has been spoken between spouses, even driving in cars, maybe even on the way to church. You're revealing things now, God, by your spirit. This isn't just another sermon, God. This has been prophetic for many lives in this place. But God, I pray that they don't just hear the word, but they do the word. Now our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. People are praying. This is just a private moment that we, we just take inventory. But if you're here right now, you say, Pastor Kevin, I, I, I love God. I serve God. I'm born again. I know I'm going to heaven. But some of the things you said tonight during your talk has given me pause for thought. Some, some of the things you said tonight, I know it's the Holy Spirit. I might not like it. I might not feel good. But I know it's the Holy Spirit. I know my emotions don't line up with it. But I can't deny God speaking directly to my heart. And you want prayer for that. In a way of asking for prayer, would you just slip your hand up and right back down. Come on. Just good, 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 good up there. Good, good, good. Back there. Good, 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 good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So many hands. So many hands. Father, I pray for every one of these that lifted their hands. I pray for every one of these, God, that said, I'm not going to live by my feelings. I'm not going to live by my emotions. I'm, not, I'm going to guard my heart. I'm going to do the things necessary. God, I'm not just going to hear this tonight. I'm going to do the word. Father, I pray they won't leave here like they came in Jesus' name. Let me ask you another question now. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, all you have is a carnal heart because your spirit is dead to Jesus Christ through sin and death. It's not a negative thing because this is a positive opportunity. Because it's not a closed door. Jesus said, whosoever will can come. Going to church don't make you Christian. Being raised in church don't make you Christian. Being baptized didn't make you Christian as a baby. Being a good person don't get you to heaven. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sins, the Bible says. No testament. That's why they would take a lamb. What, they known as, what was known as the firstborn lamb, the spotless lamb. They would slaughter that animal. The high priest would take the blood from that animal and offer it in ceremonial fashion. And it would cover the people's sins for one year. And they would have to do that every year. But because a man sinned, ultimately a man would have to die. That's why Jesus came to earth. He lived a sinless life. That's why he's referred to as the spotless Lamb of God. At the end of his life, they led him to a cross where he laid his life down, spilling out his blood. That blood doesn't cover your sins for a year. It obliterates past, present, and future sin. It ushers in the righteousness of Jesus and it brings you into a place called heaven. Heaven. Saved into a place called heaven. First of all, you're saved from an empty life in this earth. The things you're looking for. The peace you're looking for. The things you try to find in drugs or alcohol. Parties, relationships, business, money, career, hobbies, busyness. Leaves you saying there must be more to life than this. And there is, but it's not something. It's someone. His name is Jesus. Secondly, he's saved into a place called heaven. When this life is over, eternity begins. It's heaven or hell. I'm not trying to scare you. Hell wasn't created for you. Hell was created for the devil or anyone who rejects Jesus. Heaven. Heaven was created for you. He's trying to get you to heaven. 
Heaven's a perfect place. No more sickness, no more disease, no more pain. Love, joy, peace in the presence of Jesus with those that you love and those you influence to go with you. But you must be born again through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father which is in heaven but by me. So our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you one more question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? I'm not going to put a spotlight on you. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to call you forward. I just want to pray for you where you're at like I prayed for you others. But if you're here right now and you know you need Jesus, you want to go to heaven, you know you need to make it right, come on, as these others already have, will you just slip your hand up and right back down and say, pray for me. Good, God bless you. There's one. God bless you. There's two. Someone else. Is there someone else? God bless you. There's three. You can put them right back down. God bless you. There's four. Is there someone else? You'll say, Pastor Kevin, that's me. I know I need to give my life to God. Are you here? Maybe online right now. You're making this, you're making this admission. We're going to pray that include you in this prayer as well. All right? I'm going to pray a prayer. I want everyone here that lifted your hand, the four of you that lifted your hand, to repeat, repeat this prayer with me out loud. Not by yourself. Everyone here that is born again, I'm going to ask you to repeat it with them. Come on. Can we say it together? Father, Father I believe in Jesus. I believe, Jesus. I believe he's your son. I believe he died on the cross. He was buried and rose again. Jesus, I confess you now as my Lord, my Savior. Forgive me for my sin. Make me new. From this day forward, I place my life completely in your hands. And I place myself in a local church to learn more of you. That through greater knowledge of who you are, I will grow in deeper love with you. In Jesus' name. Come on, welcome these to the family of God. Come on, church. Come on, church. Celebrate. Come on. Nothing greater than that. I don't know where you stood with Christ before this. All I know is if that's you confessing Christ, you're on your way to heaven. I know Pastor Allen and the church here has steps for you to take. I know they're running various things to help you grow. They have a discipleship course that will introduce you to Jesus and the life of God. All those things. So make sure you get that in your life. Amen? Amen. Hey, listen, i got to cut out. But before I do, i got one more thing I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to receive tonight's offering. Is that all right? No? Man, where's all the amens now? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and receive an offering. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, because I don't want you just to reach and get what you think you want to give. I want you to take time and ask God what he wants you to give. Because you need to understand you're not giving to people. You're not giving to just a revival or a conference. You're giving to lives that have been born again this week. You're giving to marriages that's been restored this week. You're given to hope that's been restored this week. You're given to missions. This is a mission that your pastor invests in. I said he invests every week. So I know that pastor stands up here and asks you to give sacrificially sometimes. And sometimes it's like the, the teacher on the Peanuts commercial, you know, cartoons. Please don't tune me out right now. Because I'm telling you, my wife and I gave to this. We, we believe in this. So if you believe in people being born again, if you believe in marriages being restored, if you believe in that stuff, can you give out of your heart? And, and, and you might say, well, whatever you're giving. Well, you might want to give some more because you're investing. Wherever we go, guess what? Because of this investment, you're a part of that winning of those souls as well. And we're winning a lot of souls. How many wants to lay up treasures in heaven? I'm waiting for the rest of you. How many want to lay up treasures in heaven? Well, that's how we do it. We do it through our giving. We live to give. We love to give. That should be us as Christians. Everyone say, I live to give. I, to give. I, love, to give. I love to give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe that? Yes. How many is ready to give? Yes. You have envelopes? You have all that? We got that? Bring it up. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it, bring, come on down. Run down here like you stole something, guys. You know what that's like, right, Frankie? Your old man? <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. I love that guy. Uh, anyone need an envelope? Lift your hand up. Come on now. We're trying to hurry. Because I love you, I want you out of here. And because I have a plane to catch, I want to get out of here. Please give. Please give. And you might be sitting there going, well, I'm not giving because. Okay. Please keep your stingy money. If you can't be a cheerful giver, don't be a giver. God, God loves a cheerful giver. 
Some of you might have more than enough and you hold back. Don't do that. The more I give, the more I'm blessed. The more I give, the more I receive. 3,600 for return. That's what the Bible says. Give and it shall be given. Amen. Press down, shaken together and run it over. You can't get to press down, shaken together and run over without the give. Give and it shall be given. Everyone wants the given. But you first got to do the give. Amen? Amen? And I know you are. Father, we just thank you for those who are hilarious givers, prompt to do it givers. God, those that you love. I pray that right now, God, whatever they give, there's a 30, 60, 100 fold return. God, for those who are giving sacrificially, God, I pray that you return it immensely upon their life because they're supporting mission, they're supporting vision, they're supporting your kingdom. Father, I just pray that you would just grow this in their heart, grow this in the kingdom for them. God, that this seed, when it goes into all the speakers' lives and it goes into this church life, that they'll realize they have treasures in heaven by everyone they've touched because they've given this week. Lord, we thank you for that. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor in the name of Jesus. And we say amen. All right, guys, you may serve the people. And here is your wonderful pastor. Come on. Give it up for Pastor Allen. Okay, so let's make it right. Let's make it, let's make it official. I am taller, right? <laughs> Love you, man. You are, Betty. Love you, man. Love you, man. But I'm way better looking. I'm just saying. All right. Just kidding. All right. Just kidding. Wow, so grateful. Thankful to God for friends. Kevin is a friend, and I'm gratefully, gratefully, gratefully blessed. Um, Destiny Conference blesses a lot of us. It's a time of great fellowship. We've had some great fellowship this week. We'll be uh, going out this evening, and we'll be uh, sharing a time of fellowship, and uh, we'll be... Uh, We'll be um, fellowshipping tonight. We got some tacos, Pat. Tacos at the camp. If you'd like to join us, we would uh, we'd love to uh, join with you and fellowship Sunday morning, nine nine o'clock, eleven o'clock. Uh, thank you for your investment in the ministries of this church. Lives have been changed for sure, and I'm just so grateful to God. Would you stand? Hope you got your t-shirt. If you didn't get a t-shirt, um, they're still available. And uh, if you can't afford a t-shirt, we got some leftovers from years gone by that are five bucks a piece. So we'd love to make one of those available to you. They're beautiful shirts, great shirts. You can wear them when you uh, go to Sterling on vacation. Or wherever, Homer for a day. Thank you, Father, for loving a wretch like me. Thank you for doing what only you can do in our lives, forgiving us, blessing us. Thank you that every need is met, every provision is made. You got it. And the day you don't got it, the day it don't happen, then we'll do something different. But I thank you, God, for allowing Miriam and I to be here 32 years and running. And you've always met the needs of this church. And I know you will continue to do so as we trust you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you go. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless.